I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant. Their faces were not ashamed. The poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. O oh, free the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life? And loves many days that he may see good. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is set against those who do evil to cut off their remembrance from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart, and save such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. Father, we pray that we would be characterized as the people who trust in you, knowing that we've passed from death to life, from judgment to acquittal. We thank you, Father, that you have made us a covenant people who can speak along with the psalmist on many of these points, knowing that your eyes are upon your people, that your ears are open to our cry, that when we pray, Father, it's not a matter of wondering if you hear us, but knowing that you hear us, because your ears are open to our cry for the sake of the Lord Christ. We thank you, Father, that thou art comfortable that thou art continuously with us, that thou dost comfort us, sustain us, and to guide us. We pray, Father, that only that we might be ever more conformed to the image of thy dear Son. Grant us grace to be a people, Father, who do, as we sang, delight in your law and meditate on it both day and night. Help us not to hate you and your, or your ways. Grant us grace to realize that all your ways are pleasant. That there is no way of the Lord that is given to us that's supposed to be to us something that is frustrating or aggravating. Grant us grace to delight in your ways and your word. We thank you, Father, for the gathering of thy people, and we pray that your blessings would be upon them. Encourage them, Father, in their own daily life to find themselves learning of you. Grant them, Father, the proper reading of scripture, the proper reading of books that will encourage them to think in ways that are consistent with the way that you think about reality. Grant us, Father, insight. Grant us thy spirit that we might grow in the faith. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay, this chapter is titled Systematics and Lordship. Systematics and Lordship. The goal of systematics is to declare that God is the Lord. He is king over all creation. Psalm 10, 16, the Lord is king forever and ever. Yea, the Lord sitteth king forever, Psalm 29, 10. He is a great king over all the earth. He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. He shall... Choose our inheritance for us, the excellency of Jacob, whom he loved, Psalm 47. So a faithful systematic theology declares great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endureth throughout all the generations, Psalm 145. With this in mind, let us glance briefly at the life of a churchman and politician, a man very clearly superior to most churchmen and politicians. He is a tither and a loyal, hard-working church member. He's also a mason, and his memoirs of life on Capitol Hill, on Capitol Hill 
indicate no mandate to apply biblical requirements to law, politics, and much else in every man's working life. He can relate President Johnson's stories about flagrantly illegal voting with the same relish as Johnson, with no sense of obscene travesties on the life of the Republic. Moreover, he can cite the words of Queen Juliana of the Netherlands, a blend of deism and modern humanism, and Churchill's faith in man, with no apparent sense of their radical contradiction to biblical faith. In all this, however, he is like millions of other churchmen who feel that a very simple faith is satisfying to God. Of course, the clergy is even worse. Christian scholars and clergymen who should know better have often objected to me. What's wrong with humanism? Many pride themselves on being anti-systematic and smorgasbord approaches to religion. None of this is possible where God is indeed God, where his lordship is confessed and applied to the totality of our lives. Okay, and what our worship needs to describe for us is already many of the many people that we encounter that claim the name of Christ would just refuse to understand that being a Christian means the life of the mind. It means to think systematically. It means to begin with the God of the Bible. It means to think his thoughts after him. So many of the Christians for many, many decades now have taken the name Christ to them and have really not thought through things to have a biblical mindset. And that's what he's describing here, including, as he said, ministers. The goal of any religion, faith or philosophy, is a universal one. If it be true, it must be true for all times and in all places. Even hedonistic, relativistic humanism calls for the same universalism. Williams, who affirms the truth of hedonistic individual relativism, holds, if maximum individual long-range satisfaction makes duty for decent people, it does so for rascals also. It does so for all conscious organisms. The principle is universal. The humanists who have the sorriest grounds for asserting a universal faith are all the same succeeding because of their consistency of faith, their insistence on the universality of principle. Okay? Where do we see the universality of principle becoming more and more common in terms of humanism? Well, we see it already in our courts. Um, in Washington, there was a small florist. Remember, the, the idea we're communicating is the consistency of the principle of humanism. In Washington, there was a small florist who did serve some of their sodomite customers. However, two of their sodomite customers wanted to get married. And the florist said, um, we can't provide you with the flowers that you want of us. Um, that would be to sanction something that we believe is wrong. And, you know, would you just please look for somebody else to do business with on, on this score. So of course, what eventually happens is this couple sues the florist company, but what's more is the Attorney General of the state of Washington sues the couple as well, sues the florist rather, um, for a substantial amount. And so already we see humanism is pressing its universal principle. In other words, humanism believes it's a worldview that has to apply to everybody, and so it will be applied to everybody, even if by judicial or legislative force. This is the point that Rushton is getting at. All worldviews are totalistic. They want to reign over every area of life. And humanism, even though it's inconsistent in its systematics, is no different. Of course, the subset of this, or the sub-message, is that Christianity should be the same way. Churchmen are, meanwhile, faltering and failing because of their lack of any universal application. By their affirmation of the triune God, the churchmen should, more than anyone else, insist on the Catholicity and universality of the Christian faith and biblical law. Very early, however, it was precisely this factor which was abandoned. Pierre Boyle, 1647 to 1706, first a Protestant and then a Catholic, but in essence a Cartesian in philosophy, actually held that there's no necessary connection. He held that there's no necessary connection between religion and morality, a belief that brought him in his day much hostility. Now, more ready to believe that atheists are not moved to a new ethical premise by their unbelief. Churchmen too often reject the idea of necessary connections because between ideas and action, faith and life, and principles and things. To reject or underrate such a necessary connection is to deny God implicitly or explicitly and to affirm a, universal, a universe of chance connections. In a Darwinian world, of course, it follows that connections are either products of chance or man-made. If man-made, then systematics, of course, is anthropology. No divine decree is then permitted because God then becomes the inescapable Lord and God and not man. The whole point of David's psalm, as of all scripture, is that God is creator, preserver, and redeemer is a necessary connection between all things. David can therefore declare, the eyes of all wait upon thee, 
and thou givest them their meat in due season. Our Lord declares that God the Lord is the governing and necessary connection in life and death of a sparrow, and in man's life as well as the very numbers on the hairs of his head. Balmer, in discussing the rise of political absolutism in the modern age, rightly sees absolutism as closely identified with the idea of sovereignty. When sovereignty was transferred from God to the political order, absolute power began to accrue where? I'll read that again and then ask the question. When sovereignty was transferred from God to the political order, absolute power began to accrue where? Political order. Huh? In the political order. Right, which is known as state. the state or the government. Yep. We can add further that universality or Catholicity was also necessarily transferred to the state as an aspect of sovereignty. Not surprisingly, this has led to demands for a one-world state. The feebler concept of the medieval church, Catholic and mildly absolutist, has given way to modern totalitarianism. Marxism, fascism, and the democracies each dream of a world state, Catholic or universal, sovereign, absolute. This is the ancient dream of Babylon, the greater Babylon. It will not be answered or dissolved by piecemeal and non-principled opposition. Peaceful opposition. For example, R.C. Sproul uh, Sr. recently wrote something against abortion. It was a wonderful piece. It was very good. But the problem, our problem really isn't abortion. You see, we, we, we tend to attack things piecemeal instead of getting at the root of the matter. And the root of the matter is statism. You want to get rid of abortion? You want to get rid of sodomy? You want to get rid of, uh, of health care? Then you have to attack where the sovereignty lies. And the sovereignty lies in the state. You have to attack statism. So this is the ancient dream of Babylon the Great of Babel. It will not be answered or resolved by piecemeal and non-principled opposition. Non-principled opposition. The reason that we have such a hard time opposing humanism is because we have so much of it where? In us. And so we don't, we don't buying in to their worldview somewhat dilutes our ability to resist them because we've already been compromised because we've already bought in in large measure to their worldview. And so what Rush Tooney is teaching here in terms of Christ's Lordship and Systematics is that Christ's Lordship teaches us that his Lordship is totalistic. In other words, there's no place where he is not Lord and King as opposed to other Lords and Kings who claim totalistic sovereignty. Against the systematics of the humanist world order, we must declare the systematics of a theology faithful to the triune God and his infallible, inerrant word. The systematics of humanism is in self-contradiction. It is false, destructive of itself and man and vapid. But if churchmen have no systematics, if they themselves do not think systematically, they cannot counter the reigning evil, they have disarmed themselves. So Rush Uni again is saying here the importance of systematics, if we can't think systematically, if we can't think in terms of holes, then we will we will we're unarmed. There's no there's no defeating the juggernaut that we're fa facing in humanism, even though humanism doesn't have any answers. When Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, Necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. He meant indeed that his calling from God was an urgent, mandatory one, but he meant far more. Necessity, in the Greek that's anake, that which must or needs be, means the total necessity of God's word and his government. It is inclusive of all reason, determination, and meaning. The totality of God's decree, providence, and calling place a necessity upon Paul. The necessity is theistic, cosmic, and personal. Today, the determination is necessity is essentially and often exclusively personal. A thing is necessary because we deem it so. Systematic theology must affirm that the Lord God is a necessary cause, connection, will, power, and action in all things. Anything short of that is not theology, but anthropology. Anything short of that must abandon the psalmist to sing praises to man. Power and necessity are then ascribed to man. But David declares in Psalm 47, 6 and 7, Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises unto our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. This is the task of systematic theology, to sing praises to God, the Lord, with understanding. The point that he's emphasizing here is that 
if we don't, again, if we don't think systematically with Christ as the center and Christ as Lord, then we, will be, then we won't be able to oppose other totalistic uh, worldviews and theologies. Remember, every worldview by its nature is totalistic, which is another way of saying that it wants to do what? Control. Take over everything. Yeah, it wants to influence, control, have its law rule over everything. And that's what's happening increasingly um, with humanism. I told you the story about the florist. There's another one in Arizona about a, um, somebody who makes cakes. Almost the same exact story, although I don't know if Arizona is suing them or not, like Washington is the florist. But humanism, what it wants to do is it won't be satisfied until it takes over everything and creates, indeed, the new world order that, that Rush to me uh, briefly alert, uh, averred to in that particular chapter. I, I thought businesses used to have the right to refuse service to people if they wanted. I thought so, I, too. But I, I recall that. I mean, I remember, there again, I don't know whether that was legal or not, I don't know, but I remember seeing signs. They signs. explain why, and then they can say that they're... Right, I mean, that goes back to the civil rights thing, right? You, you know, if somebody comes in, you have to serve them. You know, you can't deny them service based on, you know, the list. So I think it's probably falling, on, follow, falling under the same, same rubric. How would you answer a Christian friend who says, well, I'm doing this because, you know, God gave us a mind to think. I mean, it may not be something that's necessarily in opposition to scripture, but I don't know, I'm trying to think. Well, I guess I think sometimes when I hear Christians feeling like it's all right to use birth control for the express purpose of preventing a birth, and they... Well, I, I think all things, regardless of what they are, they need to be tested, tested by the scripture. If I was engaging somebody with a conversation like that, I would, would, I would say... It isn't it interesting, though, that before 1920, every, every expression of the church, every denomination, all thought, all believed, all taught that that was a sin? And what do you suppose has changed since 1920 to make it not a sin? And then I, you know, and then I, would, you know, I would try not to be dogmatic, but then I would try to, to look at Scripture to see what Scripture, if Scripture teaches anything, what it suggests to that. Uh, I'm not going back and look at how the church reasoned before 1920 about that particular issue. Um, see, we've, we've allowed so many people to become autonomous in their thinking about all kinds of things um, that it's not uncommon for people to say that kind of thing. Well, God has given me a mind, and so basically that's another way of saying I can do what I want. Uh, but some issues, of course, are more complicated than other issues. I mean, we'll deny that for sure. Any other questions? Prayer requests, praise items this evening? When does Jonathan leave for up north? Friday. Friday? Friday's late in the day. Okay. He's Jane? got a, he's got kind of a tough week this week. He's got a lot of things oh, nice. scheduled and planned and there's obviously some conflicts between his work and other things. So just prayers for him that things will get straightened out for him. Okay. Jane? Yes. Tennis huh? family. Tennis family. Yeah. Uh, there's an area family that um, one of their children who had developmental problems uh, died in her sleep last night. Um, then her last name is Tennis. So that's, that's who that family is. Right. Anybody else? There was that lady that had trouble walking this morning. Does she have muscular dystrophy or multiple sclerosis? No, they, you know, they've looked and looked and looked and tried to figure out what the problem is and they haven't been able to find out what the problem is. It's, it shows itself as seizures, so, um, but they haven't been able, nobody's been able yet to, yeah. no doctor's been able to figure out what it is, mm. although she has had lots of people look at it from what I understand. That was really scary this morning, it looked just like her legs were made of rubber, she just yeah. caved in. Yeah, it was, you're right. Yeah. Okay, let's go to prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come before your throne of mercy to find grace and help in our time of need. We're mindful especially of those people who are in need. We think especially of the tennis family during this time. We ask for Mike and his wife that you would 
be especially near to them during this time of grief, help them not to grieve as those without hope, but help them to grieve as those that are sad. Again, Father, we wouldn't pretend to understand your providence and your ways with men. We pray, however, though, that they would entrust themselves to you, knowing that there was no place else to turn during this time. We thank you for the life that she lived. We thank you, Father, for the memories that the family will always have. We pray, Father, Father, for the rest of the children in the family whose hearts will be heavy as well. We pray you continue that you would buoy them and that you would give them strength during this time. As we and our other families within the church community have opportunity, we pray, Father, that you would give us a tenderness as warranted, uh, grant us grace to speak gentle words and tender words into their lives. And we pray, Father, that you would ever you'd be the God of all comfort to them during this time. We pray, Father, that whoever has the funeral will preach Christ, direct people to the resurrected and ascended Christ, that people might find their hope in the same Savior in which their daughter put her trust in. So encourage them, Father, in the days ahead. Help them, Father, to find comfort from friends and those who love Christ. We think of Jonathan with all that is before him this week. We pray you would encourage him, Father. We're thankful that he's a young man that you form with a conscience who loves you. We pray you would encourage him, help his group to do well as they go to this uh, competition north. We pray, Father, that you would keep them in their traveling mercies and bring them back safely. Pray with all the different things that he's juggling in his schedule this week that you would continue um, to help those things land in the proper place and help him to prioritize as he needs to. We think, Father, of Anthony, continue to ask that you would open up other doors of employment for him. And it just seems, Father, that this job is um, rubbing him down to a nub. And so we pray that you would open up other doors opportunity so that he can continue to do what he's doing so well and that is providing for his wife and child. Continue, Father, to encourage him. We would, Father, earnestly pray that you would open doors. We pray that this time that he gets to spend with his friend Jeff this week will be beneficial for both of them, that they would encourage one another during this time. Father, we do think of the Richards, we think of Misty, who had a, a seizure attack, whatever it's called. We pray, Father, that now that they're in Michigan, and perhaps with, with Sonny having a better job, that perhaps if they can find what the, the problem is here, be able to locate it, be able to isolate it, be able to treat it. Thank you, Father, for the sympathetic hearts of the congregation going out to them. And we do pray that you would grant them grace to find an answer to this during this time. We are mindful again and thankful, Father, for how you spared Anna and those people that were in the other vehicle. We are thankful, Father, that this did not lead to death. We're, we continue to be amazed at your kindness. Help our gratitude, Father, never to wear off us all to be mindful of how to be thankful to you for our children and our families. And grant us grace, Father, to continue to look for you, look to you for provision in all things. Father, we continue to ask for Sam and his wife Sandy up there at River Terrace. We pray, Father, that you'd give the whole Perry family grace to minister Christ there. We thank the Father for his desire to see your name go forward in that congregation, that your name might be honored. 
as I have an opportunity, Father, to speak into Sam's life. I pray that you would give me wisdom. Help him, Father, as he as he works to move towards a, a new way of doing things, to be wise as a serpent, but harmless as a dove, grant him grace to be circumspect. Surround him, Father, with, with, uh, with allies. And we pray, Father, that you would give him the grace to speak forth the whole counsel of God to the people that you put in his life. We pray that you would raise up many like uh, Sam and the CRC, that the CRC might know what it means to know uh, reformation and renewal as we propel on the next month and a half, two months towards the Synod. We pray that um, those that are Orthodox biblical Christians would find their voice and they know how to speak in the times in which you've given them the Synod in which they're gathering at. I'll be honest, Father, I oftentimes have little hope for the CRC, and yet little hope is not no hope. And so, Father, we pray that even at this late hour that you might grant reformation within this denomination. Thank you again, Father, for reminding us these past few days of, of the saints of God and their tenderness towards us. Thank you, Father, for the fact that you have raised up saints love us. It's encouraging, Father, to be loved by your people. Grant grace now for the rest of the service. Help us to exalt your name in all things. In Christ's name, amen. amen. All right. In the 20 minutes we have left, we'll turn to Romans 1 briefly. in them, for God has shown unto them, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God to an image like a corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who created the truth of God, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burning their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due them. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to the base mind to do those things which are not fitting. It's here in verse 28, we want to especially emphasize, although some of these other matters will come to the fore. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. And it gives a list of what those things are. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death and only do the same but approve of those who practice them. Father, we pray that you would give us thy spirit as we consider for these few minutes the danger of not retaining God in their knowledge and our knowledge in Christ that we pray. Amen. Alexander Schultz Peterson, who is actually one of the greats of the 20th century, received a, a Templeton Prize years and years ago. Alexander Sosa Heatson has in the last couple years, three years, I think, has, uh, has passed away. I would highly recommend Alexander Sosa Heatson as one of those people that if you have opportunity to, to return to and read over and over again, he's one of those people who wrote so much that uh, you could say of him, like instead of Augustine, he who says they've read all of Souls and Heats and Lies, uh, simply because he wrote so much and it wouldn't be possible to read everything that the man wrote. But one thing that he said in his Templeton address um, was really quite interesting, down consistent with what we've read here, did not like to retain God in their knowledge. He said, 
when he received the prize in his address, he said, more than half a century ago, while I was still a child, I recall hearing a number of older people offer the following explanation for the great disasters that had befallen Russia. They would say, men have forgotten God, that's why all this has happened. Solzhenitsyn goes on to say, since then I have spent well nigh 50 years working on the history of our revolution. In the process, I've read hundreds of books, collected hundreds of personal testimonies, and have already contributed eight volumes of my own towards the effort of clearing away the rubble left by that upheaval, referring, re, referring to the Russian Revolution. But if I were asked today to formulate as concisely as possible the main cause of the ruinous revolution that swallowed up some 60 million of our people, I could not put it more accurately, accurately than to repeat, men have forgotten God. That's why all this has happened. That's consistent with what we read here in Romans. Men did not like to retain God in their knowledge. And so, uh, we might ask of ourselves, just as Solzhenitsyn examined what happened in his country, we might ask of ourselves, uh, why is this nation considering legalizing sodomy at the Supreme Court level? Why have we fallen prey to the illusion that is status death care? Why are we even discussing violation of the Second Amendment? The answer is simple. It's the same one that Solzhenitsyn gives. Men have forgotten God. If men forget God, then a vacuum is created that is filled by godless men. Because, of course, we've said countless times that when you roll God off, you try to push God off, it's not as if you no longer have a God concept. God is an inescapable concept. Man cannot live without some kind of God in his life. And so when men no longer retain the knowledge of the God of the Bible, they do retain a knowledge of some God who is not a God, and that is the God they worship. And so when we get rid of the truth of God, the reality of his existence, when we roll him off his throne, so we think, it is the case that that vacuum is filled by godless men. And godless man, by definition, is a demon, and he'll seek to destroy all social order that is related to the social order of the one true God. Some of that social order is, is set here. It talks about um, God giving them up to vile passions, giving them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts, the dishonor of their bodies among themselves. It talks about the unnatural relations that begin to be entered into when men do what? When men forget God. It's no more complicated than that. Yes, it may take some time to explain and tease out the connection between the two, but when you do that, you begin to understand that Solzhenitsyn was exactly right. All that revolution there in the Soviet Union or Russia at the time, 60 million deaths, and all of it was because men forgot God. When men forget God, then ugly things begin to happen. When men forget God, as I referenced this morning, you get guys like Kermit Gosnell operating on an abortion clinic since 1972, but only recently busted because he, they, people finally decided to care that he was killing infants born alive in the most gruesome way possible. Some of the reports you can read about in the English newspapers because the American newspapers don't want to cover it because they want to continue to do what? Forget God. And so we're not getting much of reporting of it going on here, but we're getting a great deal of reporting of it if you want to look in the English newspapers. And of course, I don't get to actual papers. This is all mm -hmm. online. So men have forgotten God, and in doing so, they've become, they become beasts. That's what is described here. Um, the uses of their bodies ends up being against nature. It's contrary. It's anti-nature. And so men become beasts. Man cannot forget God without losing his own humanity. I've tried to teach you that over and over again. Whenever man strikes out, to, whenever man reaches out to strike God, he always hits himself. Man loses his humanity when he throws off God or when he forgets God because man is only man. Man gets his mannishness in the fact that he's rather related to, to God. The 20th century has been one long testimony, one long experiment of man trying to successfully build a social order while at the same time forgetting God. Indeed, as we were learning in our Modernity series, you can pack that up, back it up all the way to the Enlightenment, the beginning of the Enlightenment in the 18th century. So men have become beasts. They've lost their humanity, yet fallen man would rather embrace 
We'd rather embrace living in the ugly environment, environs of the beast where nature is red in tooth and claw than remember God and his Christ. Here we see the extremes that man will go to in order to, in order to avoid having Christ rule over him. Remember that phrase from the scripture, we will not have this man rule over us. And that's where modern man is today. He'll go to any kind of extreme he can to avoid the rule of God. Men have forgotten God, as Lord Heatson says, and so they shred all God-ordained design and distinction in favor of a world where all colors bleed into one. Men have forgotten God. There's something here we need to keep in mind. When men forget God, part of what they're trying to do is they're trying to erase the distinction between themselves and God. And so one way they go about manifesting that and showing that, this attempt to, to erase the distinctions between man and God, is they begin to erase all the distinctions between everything else here. We're going to erase the creator-creature distinction. And so one way to go about successfully erasing the creator-creature distinction is to erase all the distinctions here. If we can get rid of all the distinctions here, then we can convince ourselves at the same time there's no distinction where. This way, right? So the fact that we, we're constantly consumed with erasing distinct, distinctions. Men are the same as women, women are the same as men. Women can fight in combat as successfully as men. Women can fight, uh, uh, can fly fighter, uh, fighter jets as successfully as men can. As we continue to try to erase these distinctions, it's just testimony of trying to do what Paul talks about here, what Solzhenitsyn talks about, forgetting God. Sometimes we make things incredibly complex, but we keep going back to these simple ideas of, of forgetting God with the ramifications of that means we're successful in helping ourselves to understand what's going on here. So men have forgotten God, so they enter into the war of all against all, as each individual man seeks to exercise his godhood as over against the godhood of his neighbor. Right? Here's another implication of man forgetting God. When man forgets God, then there's only one other option left for most men, and that is they're going to be God. But see, everybody comes to the same conclusion. Mm -hmm. And so you end up getting the warfare of all against all. So when we forget God, we end up, as we taught Sunday school this morning, we end up introducing, by necessity, the conflict of interest. Because every God wants everybody else to serve him or her. So when men forget God, you end up having this friction, these tensions, and revolution, which Sosan Heaton wrote so much about during his life. So when, all, when men forget God, all men seek to be God, so all men seek to destroy one another. Because gods cannot abide competition. Men have forgotten God, and so they shred all God-ordained design and distinction in favor of a world where all colors bleed into one. And forgetting God, man seeks to integrate himself downward into the void, since integrating upwards into God's design is no longer an option since men have forgotten God. You see, what we're saying here is that when we presuppose the existence of God, we understand there's a creator-creature distinction. We, when we understand God, we have the opportunity, as we bow the knee to Christ, to be, become more and more Christ-like. But if you eliminate the idea of God, there's only one direction that we can integrate, and that direction to integrate is where? Downward. Downward. So that we become even less human, even less, have less mannishness, as Schaefer used to talk about, um, with each passing generation, with each passing year. Men have forgotten God, so they lose even the idea of the author in literature. This whole idea of deconstructionism, which I've talked somewhat about, um, it's still in the university from what I understand, but it's the idea that you become an English major, you study literature, and in the course you learn a philosophy, it's called deconstructionism, and that philosophy of literature teaches that there is no what? There's no author, right? And if there's no author, then there's no intended meaning. Now, they understand that there literally was somebody who, who wrote the book, but what they're saying is that since we can't get back to the author, we can't find out his intended meaning, therefore meaning is up for grabs. We've lost the author. This is the natural result of men forgetting God, because if you admit that there's an author with intended meaning, 
then really the implication of that, if you keep pulling that string, is that there's a bigger author who gives meaning to everything else. And so in deconstructionism and uh, the philosophy of literature, deconstructionism has arisen as a direct consequence of forgetting God. If we're going to have to forget God, we're going to have to forget the author as well. Because in forgetting the author, then we can make up our own meaning to the, with whatever piece of literature that we're dealing with. So when men forget God, it has all kinds of implications. It ends up rippling out in all kinds of different directions. So we lose the idea even of the author in literature. And when you lose the, author, the idea of the author in literature, then it's really a completely subjective uh, grab bag over analysis of literature. It can mean anything you want it to mean. The idea of an author who must be considered an understanding, a given piece of literature must be rejected. Since such an understanding hints too much to the idea that there's an author whose intent must be considered when it comes to our living. When men forget God, there's not only no God and no God intent, there are no authors and no authorial intent. And so the disappearance of God requires the disappearance of the author. When men forget God, then all is chaos, and we return to old chaos and dark night. When men forget God, they turn to chaos, oddly enough, to find order. Order can no more be birthed from chaos, and beauty can be birthed out of cultural Marxism. Again, if you eliminate God, then you eliminate also the idea of order, which we talked about somewhat this morning. But that has implications as well, because at that point, then you're going to have the conviction that where we're at now came out of chaos. There was no God, then where we're at now, whatever order we have, where did it come from? As I said, it came out of chaos. So that if I want to be socially regenerated, what do I have to return to? Chaos. Chaos, right? And so modern man finds himself constantly returning to chaos because he hopes out of chaos, what will, what will be birthed? Order. Order. Yeah, we talk about that, we see that as being upside down and backwards. But that's, that's all the same, that's what modern man believes. We see it, were we teaching on this Wednesday? I think we were. But we, we see it in the, um, in the Mardi Gras. The Mardi Gras is wild bedlam, right? It's, it's, it originates as a religious festival. But the whole idea it's communicating is that, you know, you have this bedlam and then, and then out of that order comes. And so modern man is constantly returning to revolution. Revolution becomes his answer because revolution can birth the order that he's looking for. So men forgetting God leads to men returning to chaos in order to try to find order. And chaos, of course, in, our, in a social order means, means revolution. So there's all kinds of implications to men forgetting God. When men forget God, life has no value, no objective value any least. Death has no solution. Thought has no meaning. Joy has no reference point. And as we talked this morning, meaning is illusory. So when men forget God, you have all kinds of vile perversions that begin piling up upon themselves. Integrity becomes rare. And the bodies start piling up. Because men without God, all they can create is social order chaos. And we begin to see the bodies pile up. 50 million dead children over since 73 is a testimony of men doing what? Forgetting God. If so, uh, Social Heatson can apply this principle to Russia, how much more so can we apply it to the nightmare that's been the abortion industry? So when we forget God, we end up, we don't hurt God, we end up damaging ourselves. And here's this list that Paul gives of damage. Filled with unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness. The word malicious, by the way, comes from the word evil. Full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness. There are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, bolsters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Right. Now take all of those blacky things all right, and build a social order out of it. Put it into the public square so that the public square reflects all those things. And this is what Sosa Heatson saw in his lifetime, so can say men forget God. It's increasingly what we're seeing in our own lives. The problem is, though, is that we begin not to see the starkness of it because for what reason? It's all around us. And we get used to it. Yeah, yeah we get used to it. And that's, that's the danger. And so our challenge for us as Christians is to simply do, do this, to remember God. 
and to understand that if we're going to remember God in this climate that increasingly is around us, then it's probably going to be the case, at least in some quarters, that we're going to get resistance. Why? Because men don't want to be reminded of God. Well, I think the other reason is, too, is like the frog in the cattle. Right. You just, yeah, but that's another way of saying it. You little, get used to little, it. Little by little, yeah. Yep. Little by little by little. Any questions then about this evening? I stand then for a closing word of prayer. Father, we pray that we would keep things as simple as possible for our thinking, that we would see that uh, the disaster there is in forgetting God and that we would not uh, forget God ourselves and that you'd give us the ability to challenge people, even Christians sometimes who think like those who forget God. Grant us grace to be your salt and light, Father, in, in a world that is set increasingly in opposition to you and help us to be happy warriors knowing that in the end you win because you have won. Grant us grace to be the aroma of Christ and put in our past people who need Christ that they might then uh, find themselves converted because of the word preached. Grant us grace, Father, uh, to be glad about all that you've called us to. And now unto him who is able to keep him from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Rachel, can you lead some brief doxology? When peace like a river attendeth my way, when